Described as one of the 20 most influential women in fund management, educated in Holland, Taiwan and the UK, and having spent much of her career in PE, she made the non-consensus move to public markets and now oversees Bank of New York Mellon's near $2 trillion in assets and is chair of the 30% Club, about which we'll learn more. So, Hannah Smith, welcome to the Money Maze podcast. Good morning, Simon. It's very good to see you and look forward to the discussion. Well, you are our first Dutch guest. And today, one of the uh, objectives is in recognition of International Women's Day this month is to talk about progress, but alongside that leadership, motivation, culture, effecting change, and the shape of the institutional investment management industry. Now, you have a very interesting educational background, which I'd just like to start with. If I understand, you studied at the, and I'm going to call it the Nienrood University. Nienrood. Nienrood. Yes. Okay, well, I'm yes. going to come back to my Dutch later on. An MBA from the London Business School. And you also studied, I think, in Taipei? Very Is briefly, it? yes, okay. for six months. Yes. Okay, so why did you go there? So I studied at Nienrode, which was during, uh, when I studied there, offered a bachelor's degree, which in the Dutch context was relatively unusual because you may be familiar that in continental Europe, generally most degrees lead up to the equivalent of a master's. So doing a three-year degree modeled on, on, on sort of the US system uh, and UK to some degree was quite unusual. Um, it was something I wanted to pursue. I always had it in my head that I wanted to do a master's, but it did mean that my birthday is in August. I learned in another hmm. podcast that you did that your birthday is also in August. Do we need to check dates, Simon? That's absolutely. Mine's eight, 21st. The, the eight. I know, okay. I know I'm older. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so in any event, um, so I found myself uh, outside of the gates of the castle because it's sort of based around a, a little castle in the middle of the Netherlands. Um just before my 21st birthday, which was relatively young and wanted to do, wanted to get some work experience, try out some different things, which I did. So I worked for a management consultancy in Amsterdam. And then I also had the opportunity to go to Hong Kong in early 88 to do an internship with what we would now really call a venture fund. I ended up being there for about six months. Now, remember in 88, Hong Kong uh, was still part of Britain. Uh, it was well before the handover of 1997. And China, Deng Xiaoping, has just been on his drive of opening up China uh, and, and, and making it sort of more commercial. And so there was a lot of activity out of Hong Kong into China. Um, and I met quite a number of people who... Um, had mastered Mandarin, unusually so. so. A number of those were actually American, dare I say it. And they said to me, gosh, you're Dutch. You already probably speak four languages. You should go off and do Mandarin. This is our future. And so off I went to Taiwan. I thought it was a good idea. But then after six months, I thought, this is, this is a tricky language. This is going to mm. take me about four years to become somewhat remotely fluent or conversant so I can be useful. So I decided I had to be practical. I also had to earn a living. And so I applied for jobs in China so that I could both, you know, earn a living, get some experience, learn Chinese. Um, we're now in the spring of 89. China Men happened. I ended up working for Philips in Hong Kong and the rest is sort of history, uh, as they say. So I think when you're relatively young, you're probably a little bit more short term. So I thought I'm not sure I should completely stake my future. Uh, here in the region and it was time to do my MBA and that really brought me to London where I've been broadly based ever since with the exception of a year in Chicago in the late 90s. Well, I remember, and those listening or watching who do have an investment experience going back some time will remember, of course, Tiananmen Square massacre happened and the markets fell. I remember Morgan Stanley's late and great strategist, Barton Biggs, getting up at the morning meeting saying, you know, Hong Kong market has come down way too much. Um, your start back in the UK post-business school is in the private equity world. Correct. And you ended up as the CIO of Adam Street Partners. And I wonder just what it was as you became CIO that really attracted you to stay in the business for quite a long time. 
So I was in the private markets world for 22 years between Pantheon and predominantly Adam Street Partners, and I'd gone to Adam Street to set up their European portfolio and subsequently Asia. What I always loved about um, my role in Adam Street and Pantheon was, uh, was the world of investing. We were a fund of funds investor, so you looked at both fund managers as well as co-investments and secondary, so also evaluated companies. And, and to do that appropriately, because you make investments for your clients over a very long term. Here we, you know, generally uh, we have a bias towards long-term investing. I think over the long term you tend to generate better performance than than over the than over the very short term. But as a consequence, you have to think deep and hard and long about some of the long-term trends that are impacting the companies or the fund managers that, that you want to invest in. So I found it satisfied my innate curiosity about thinking about the world and trends. It, it also put me in a very fortunate position that I sort of spent a lot of time with very, very smart people uh, and got paid to do so. And uh, that was immensely rewarding. So in many ways, people would say you, you you pivot, you go to Bank of New York Mellon, it's got 240 year history, I think it will take this two trillion in assets today in 35 countries, big old business, I think market capitalization might be circa 40 billion, you'll correct me if I'm, mm -hmm. if I'm wrong. But you're going against the current because lots of people are thinking, how do I get out of the public markets universe and get into the private space? So why did you think you wanted to swim the other way? So first of all, um, it's, it's also about a journey, right? So I love the world of investing. And I think in our end clients need different types of investments, both private as well as public investments. Because in privates, of course, the one thing you don't have is really great access to is liquidity. Everything is negotiated. Every transaction is like buying a house is negotiated. There is that, that's the only market that exists. Um, and that's, of course, very, very different uh, on the public side. I left Adam Street Partners and I actually wasn't quite sure at that point in time if I was going to pursue another uh, full-time job. So I had about 18 months uh, off where I wasn't working. I was actually considering a plural career. I did conclude after about a year that I wanted to go back into an executive role because I do love being in the detail. I do love affecting change. I like working with clients. I like seeing good outcomes. And there's nothing like having the privilege of having a bit of time off to really think about, well, what are really your skills? What got you to that point? And what of that can you take somewhere else? If you, if you conclude that what you have done uh, was immensely rewarding, but I, I didn't really want to go back and do exactly the same thing, as rewarding as it had been. And I concluded that I understood the world of investing and I understood in particularly how to manage teams. I'm sure we'll talk about this more, but um, managing investment professionals is a little bit more of an art than a science. Some people talk about it that it's like herding cats. And that a is a day. skill <laughs> on a good day, or maybe tigers on a bad day, I don't know. Um, but that is a skill I honed uh, over 20, 22 years. And that was a skill I felt I could take uh, in other areas. And I was first approached, I didn't immediately come into this role. I, I first came into the BNY Mellon Enterprise as CEO of Newton. I'd actually met Helena Morrissey through our shared passion for diversity. I was at the time setting up Level 20 to focus on increasing diversity in, in the private markets world. And she, of course, had, alongside a bunch of other women and men, set up the 30% Club. So we had some conversations as to um, what was working, what wasn't working, how we could affect change. Um, and somehow that led to another conversation. And what I found in Newton, um, one of the reasons that, that attracted me was really a deep foundation in research and thematic investing. So ultimately, it is about both the sector allocation and the security selection, but how Newton approached investing was a way I understood. I was very clear that I wasn't going to come in as CIO because I do think how you manage risk and liquidity is fundamentally different to how you do that in private markets. But I did understand some of the foundations around research and really manager. Uh, I took my, if you will, my manager research skills and applied that to the portfolio management team.
Right. Well, we just pause on investment management here because a day doesn't go past when one doesn't read about more money flooding into passive, particularly out of the mm. US. You have a portfolio of asset management mm. companies, which include Walter Scott and Insight. And, you know, there is this challenge in the investment industry is that with the ubiquity of passive, particularly in the US, and it's almost the belief that, you know, alpha is so difficult to achieve that, you know, there's capitulation whilst one can argue other markets, mm. you know, that isn't the case. How are you thinking about, you know, five years hence, how that landscape alters? So I think there's a role for both in the portfolios. And one also needs to step back and really think about, and this is what we're talking to clients about, what it means sort of from a governance and sort of sh shareholder um, expectation management, uh, both for the markets and for the corporates. I thought it was very interesting at the end of last year um, that the passive, the net passive assets stood at a slightly larger number than the active assets held in portfolio. The number I, I have seen was 13.3 trillion of total passive assets versus, this came out of Morningstar, versus 13.2 trillion in active assets. So that's the first time that the pool of passive assets uh, exceeded active funds. And that was really the first time. What I think we need to, but there's also a lot of concentration risk, right? We have to remember what passive does. When you, and we have both in our portfolio, we, we deliver passive through Mellon, uh, through uh, collective investment uh, vehicles, through ETFs, uh, as well as separate mandates for clients where we mimic uh, and, and follow uh, indices. And we, as you alluded to, we also have our long-only firms that pursue active strategies in the fixed income space, multi-asset, and as well as growth equity and income equity investing. I think the one thing that is very difficult to manage, aside obviously from security selection that Active does offer, is, is sector exposure and concentration exposure. There is, this gets written about a lot as well, is the concentration risk in the S&P 500, right? If you look at the top seven um, and their contribution to the S&P 500 is probably out of proportion with the contribution, albeit significant, to US GDP. So I do think that is something clients and end investors need to consider as they make their allocation. What allocation do they want to have to overall sectors and markets and how do they, they achieve that through a mix of passive um, active public investing as well as private markets. I think there's a role for all. Clearly, cost does play a factor. And clearly, as an active manager, you do need to demonstrate outperformance. Otherwise, you can't exist. But I'm pleased that, you know, Walter Scott celebrated 40 years of investing a year ago. Um, Newton is in its fifth decade. Uh, Insight continues to do very well in LDI investing. So each of the firms have their niche, but it's something that right um, to deliver for your clients, you have to earn every year. Understood. Let's talk about the female factor. You took over the chair of the 30% Club mm -hmm. uh, last year. Some people will know, some won't. Just give us a high-level summary of why it was created and where it is in its evolution. So in 2010, if you'd come to this building, you, you would have met with, with Helena, who was uh, not only predecessor at Newton, but also the 30% Club. And she and a number of other women, this really came predominantly out of active management, out of sort of an investor group, had identified uh, alongside a number of other stakeholders that you know, diversity, uh, di having diverse teams, uh, starting with board, quite frankly, makes for better business, quite simply put. Um, and at that time, in 2010, in the UK FTSE, only 12.5% of non-exec board roles were held by women. And the idea was to increase that to a target that was not only, that was both ambitious as well as hopefully, you know, achievable. Uh, so from 12.5% to 30%. But importantly, the 30% target was set because research had shown that once you have a minority or an underrepresented group comprising 30% of roles, their voices are heard. So if you put in one woman amongst nine men, it's very difficult 
um, or a black professional amongst nine white men, um, it's very difficult for that one voice to be heard. And when that group comprises three people out of 10, it just becomes easier and they make a better contribution to the dialogue. And then second, the second part was that it was really about activating chairs and CEOs and really, you know, making sure that we all agreed that this was a business issue. So the members of the steer committee at the time wrote to the chairs and CEOs of listed companies and said, hey, we, we really think you should focus on this. And do you agree? And, and, and we got some very early um you know, male allies, as we as we would call them now, who actively promoted the benefits of diversity and, and went on a path to increase um, the number of uh, board roles that, that were held by women. And we got to the 30% target in 2019 here in the UK. In fact, we're now well ahead of 40% from a non-exec role. And then in the meantime, we've also, we're now also uh, operating out of 20 different countries. So you might ask me what's next. <laughs> well, I'm asking you two things. One is you said it may take a generation before the 30% club doesn't need to exist. Yes. So dot, 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 you know, let's just answer that one first of all. Really? A whole generation? Well, some, uh, when you look at gender pay gap and other, other equality measures, it might actually take about 100 years before we get to um, parity if you will, looking at it through a gender lens, depending on what study you, you, you sort of consider. I think for us, it's really now about what is beyond 30% and what is, you know, we still need to be on the path to parity. I don't think that has to be 50-50. It could be 40-60, 60-40, but I do think we need to continue one in the boardroom. But secondly, we really need to ensure that we focus now on executive roles. Because once you break, once you start to look at CEO roles, CFO roles, chairs, senior independent directors. Um, there's a real scarcity at this point um, from the perspective of women occupying those roles. And that is true for the FTSE 100, FTSE 350, uh, as well as uh, the S&P 500. So there is still a lot to do and that, that will take time because you then need to work with companies and look deeper into their pipeline as companies are doing and bring up the women to ensure that they're ready to actually take that step when positions open up. And if you had a scorecard and you were able to look at the US and continental Europe, yes, just give us a sense of where you think the UK is and where the rest of the world is. So it's actually very similar between the US and the UK. And when you look at the executive roles, so it's about 10% of companies in the S&P 100 and the FTSE 100 that have a female CEO. You know, sometimes there's a little bit of a joke as to how many females there are relative to men named John or Sam. And when so we actually um, looked at this and when we look at the S&P 500, there are now 41 women, which in the S&P 500 CEOs, which is the same number as men named John. Got it. Well, I know that... Um Lots of research studies show that diverse companies outperform their less diverse peers. I know that Peter Harrison from Schroeder has made the point that neurodiversity is an absolute yes. essential agree ingredient. We'll come back to balance later on. But I couldn't help but look back at PE, and we've had a lot of private equity firms, so they need to pay attention here. Why is private equity so much worse in female representation? So I think there it takes even longer to come up the ladder. You also there need to look at the structure of the organizations, right? So if you, if, if you step back for a moment, typically they raise their money from their investors through what are called closed-end funds. Those funds tend to run for um, 10, sometimes 15 years, uh, and typically they're key person provisions tied to those funds. So there is a moment... Um, in time when changes can be made, so where there's a natural point for, say, managing partners uh, to consider to retire, which then opens up the funnel and, you know, prom promotions can be considered. But that tends to happen sort of naturally every four or five years. So it's, a, it's probably a little bit slower than in the corporate world. I would also say um, from a recruitment perspective, it's taken some time for women 
to actually join private equity firms at more junior levels. Um, this is not because those firms haven't been looking, but I think a transaction-based environment can be quite hard to manage right at the point in time when someone might consider starting a family or might be balancing other things in their lives. I think firms have gotten a lot better to providing support for women in the workplace. And I actually like to think that Level 20, which I set up with another 11 women, uh, contributed to that thinking. So let's talk about leadership, because under this heading, we've got, you know, affecting change, handling challenges, building resilience. I just start, start with a interesting quotation. We've got actually an interview in a couple of days time with David Schwimmer, who is CEO of the of LSEC, the London Stock Exchange Group. And he said it's more important to be respected than to be liked. And I wonder how you manage that challenge. I think it's a very good and very valid comment. I think another comment that's often made is it's quite lonely in these roles, which I think points to the same thing. We, of course, as human beings, most of us also want to be liked. But what happens in these roles, you do have to make some quite difficult decisions at times uh, about the direction of the company. And, and, and sometimes that actually means it it can affect other people in your work environment. And as a consequence, it's quite difficult to build up a particular kind of closeness that you might have built up at an earlier part of your career. Having said that, I am very focused on collaboration and inclusion. I have an open door policy. People do know I'm very approachable. Got it. Very clear. And I think that's, that is the only way to, to lead. But what of the skills that you built over the years and mm. have helped you most today? One skill um, is I'm, I'm, I'm probably by nature, uh, even though I'm doing this interview, more of a listener and an observer than a, than a talker. So I tend to listen first because it's how I learn. Uh, it's how I learn about the world of investing and it's also how I learn about colleagues, clients, what motivates them. So I tend to come from a questioning mindset and then listen to, to what comes back. Secondly, um, having honed my skills in the investments industry, uh, I've, I'm very, and it's probably also who I am, uh, I, I've, I'm very much a fact-based decision maker. So with the listening, I also look for fact patterns, um, you might have a sort of gut feel or an intuition about something, but I do want to check that initial hypothesis. I think it's quite important. And certainly when it comes back again to having to make more tricky decisions in the workplace, if you can actually lead your colleagues with you through, um, through foundation of facts, I find that very, very helpful. And then thirdly, it's about resilience. Uh, you, you kind of have to deal with what comes your way. And it can be, you know, the moment when someone says, can I just pop in your office for a minute? And you don't really know what it's about. But of course, you're thinking, mm, there might be a problem in the portfolio, person might be leaving, you know, your brain, um, there tends to be a problem. Uh, now, I do like it when people also come to me with <laughs> solutions. I'm probably not the first person to have said that. Um, but, but you sort of, every day, for a leader, you, of course, have a huge amount of structure to your day. But what you really need to plan for is the stuff that you don't know that is actually going to happen. And to be able to deal with that, I think you need a lot of resilience and, and you need to be able to sort of bounce back from things that could set you back. So and I've I'm, been pretty good in dealing with that. So I'm going to embarrass myself with a little touch here, which is, uh, I read an expression, which is Hoge Bomen vangen viel wind, which is yeah. high trees catch a lot of wind. Hoge Bomen vangen viel wind, yeah. yeah. So uh, when things aren't working so well, how have you responded? What advice do you think is relevant for lots of other aspiring leaders? So it depends on what's not working well. So, so I think there's sort of two two examples. You could have a crisis in your area. It can be in our case in the portfolio or with a client or something that's happened in operations. And I find sort of knuckling down with the team, um, almost not quite like a war room situation, but trying to help 
work through the issues and solve them for for the relevant stakeholders, I think can, can be very, very helpful and, and is good for it from a team spirit perspective. The second piece is around accountability and ownership. I think I, I tend to be very clear while I seek input from people and I am very collaborative, I'm also comfortable coming to the end of a discussion, taking a decision. And I'm also aware that there will be times when I know that the decision might not be a decision that some of my colleagues would have pursued. If that decision then doesn't work out so well, I'm also comfortable going back to my colleagues and saying, you know, a year ago we had this discussion, I decided to go left, some of you thought we should be going right. Actually, that wasn't a good decision. Here's what I've learned from it. And I think, I think you need to demonstrate accountability, ownership, but also some vulnerability towards your colleague and an appetite for learning. I think the day you stop displaying that you're still here to learn because you don't have the answer to everything as a leader is the other thing I would say to aspiring leaders. Don't expect to get to the top and think that you know everything. You don't. You're learning every day and you're learning with your team. And did you yourself run into either glass ceilings or resistance along the way that you had to confront? No, I've been very, very fortunate. The first two organizations I joined uh, at Pantheon and uh, what became Adam Street Partners, I was actually recruited by the equivalent of sort of a female managing director um, who I learned a lot from. But there were also... Now that I look back upon it, the male leadership of those organizations were also very, very um, good in bringing up talent full stop, uh, irrespective of gender or socioeconomic background, um, ability. They just wanted, they wanted talent. Um, so while I might think that I really analyzed that 30 some years ago as I entered the workplace, perhaps there was some unconscious bias. I think that that was a very fortunate uh, set of circumstances. But I also think one of, one of the things that I did very much in the first 10, 15 years of my career, which I tend to say to young women and men as well, is it's really putting your head down. You have to master some skill. There's just stuff you need to do in the first one or two decades of your career. And sometimes I find um, the discussions I now have with perhaps the younger, the newer generation is that there's too much focus on that career path. And my advice tend to be, tends to be just focus on doing your job, do it well, make sure you exceed in it and you'll get the next opportunity and then perhaps at some point you lift your head and you start to think about how you can broaden your skill set. But you have to deliver first and you have to learn a craft, yeah. whatever yeah. it is that you do. Now you're a global CEO sitting out of London. Mm -hmm. You know, lots of conversation about London at the epicenter or maybe not such an attractive place. Why London was there a great discussion about where you should sit and what are its what are the great advantages or not of, of, of being here running this business? So interestingly enough, I've always been, for the most part, based out of London, I think, and, and it's particularly relevant, it has continued to be relevant for this role as well. Um, our business is split pretty much 50-50, looking at it through the investment management lens, not the BNY lens, uh, between the US and the UK. When I was considered for this role, we did have the discussion as to whether I should move to New York or not. We were then also in the middle of COVID, so our world was a little bit different. So we thought we'd start out um, obviously virtual. And then I, I think you just focus on making it work. Um, from an investment management perspective, half the staff are actually in this building that we're sitting in uh, today, Simon. Um, and then the other half is spread mostly between New York and Boston, a little bit of San Francisco and, and APAC and uh, some of the continental European countries. What I think is great about London, because we do cover the world, albeit 90% of it for me is US and, and Europe regionally, from a time zone perspective, I can cover everyone in my day. I'm happy to start a bit early. I'm happy to take a phone call in the evening from from the US, but I can cover 
all markets between sort of 6 a.m. and 8 p.m. And, and, and that's a useful thing. So one of the other aspects we don't talk about perhaps enough is the role of the mentor in an organization. Mm -hmm. I know having been at large corporations is that there's lots of chat about them, but, but good mentors can really make a difference. How do you make sure that in this organization, the mentor program, if you run it, really is effective? that it takes time and it takes grit. And I think both sides need to make it work, right? I always say to mentees, you need to be very clear what you want to get out of the mentoring relationship as well. It's not as if your mentor just comes with a package and says, here's how we're going to do this. Why do you actually want to be part of a mentoring program? And how do you see your career progress? Because it's only then that the mentor can be the most effective in, in guiding you and giving you advice. Do you think the stock market understands your company? I'm sure your research has shown this. We are actually the oldest company in the S&P 500. We're celebrating 240 years this year. We were the first company traded on the New York Stock Exchange. And, you know, if you, know, if, if you forgive me and stay with me for a mm -hmm. moment, looking at it from an investment management perspective, it's all about context. So when I look at the at business models and I look at the S&P 500, right, the S&P 500 was launched in 1957. Do you know how many companies are still that were in the S&P 500 then are still in it today? Okay, so you put me on the, on, on the, on, under the spot. I'll have Tw the answer. 25. Uh, it's, 50, it's double that. It's 54. Okay. But just over just over 10%. So that, that tells you that just under 90%, you know, is, is newer. And in that, and then when you also look at the top seven in the current SM, you know, that are really driving the S&P 500, as we were talking about earlier, um, I think the oldest... Uh, Apple and Microsoft were founded in the 70s, and then some of the others were founded sort of in the 90s and, and the 2000s. So they're relatively young, right? We often talk about in these conversations about the Kodak moment, and that's, of course, when you run a business, that is always the moment you're fearful of. But, but there, there are many of those moments that have occurred when, when you sort of follow these stats. So coming back to being my melon, I, I think there's something really special about the place because it combines, you know, safety and soundness. We, we like to say we sort of do three things for clients in, in plain language. We manage money, which is sort of my world. We move money, which is my colleagues in treasury, clearance and collateral markets, and we keep it safe custody business, right? Manage, move it, keep it safe. That's a really important part of the financial infrastructure. It's probably not as well understood and we're, and we're working quite hard in making sure that, the, um, that our relevant stakeholders and shareholders do understand that. And it also really affords us with the opportunity to do more with the data that as a consequence we have in our system. We, we keep safe 20% of the world's investable assets. That's a lot of data that, where, you know, that gives us insight into trends. Um, and the, some of those insights we can share back with our clients. So that's very nicely expressed. And if you didn't read it or watch it or see it, Michael Mubisan was a guest on the show talking about the life cycle of U.S. corporations. Mm. He, of course, is the Benjamin Graham chair at Columbia. Yes. Uh, it's a really good piece of Morgan Stanley research, which we will re-release. But if you didn't see it, it's, it's absolutely fascinating because why are there so few fewer companies listed? Why are companies staying private for longer? Why is actually, yes. why have so few companies contributed to the performance over a very long time period? So two final questions. You meet a lot of interesting people in the investment industry. Who's the one person you'd like to sit down and have dinner with? Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett. You know, when you have dinner with him, can you ask him to come on the show, please, as well? Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> and my final question um, after that book, if you could tell us just one thing, what would be the piece of advice that would be top of your list? So I've been in this country over 30 years and I've always been struck by this expression of, what do you call it, the stiff upper lip of sort of stay calm. It's more about staying calm and carry on. I do think when you, when you work in investment management or in leadership role, as, as we talked about earlier, there's lots of things that don't quite work out. I think it's really important 
not to panic, but to go back to knuckling down and work out a solution. Okay, well, that's super. And that's a really good place to end. Um, I always summarize uh, one, two, three points that I've taken away. And you made two very interesting points, which um, which may seem at one level contradictory, but a very, very interesting one for younger people, keeping your head down and doing the job well for one, two decades is really important. Somebody else has said, you uh, don't wait for your next job to, do, to give your best performance. Mm -hmm. um, but equally, you, and I wrote this down, you had the privilege of time off. So for people in a later stage in their mm -hmm. careers listening, we have a lot you know, of, of you know, different age cohorts, is that you're right, um, we're all in a hurry. So yes. a little time off to reflect, um, maybe underestimate it. I think it's, it really helps me. And I think having had, having had that privilege, because it really is a privilege, it does. I think at the start of that journey, I had different thoughts than, than I had a year later. Um, and it came from networking, some deep reflections, speaking to people who knew me well, that you know, gave me very interesting insights that I then pursued. Fantastic. Hanega, thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Simon. All content on the Money Maze podcast is for your general information and use only and is not intended to address your particular requirements. In particular, the content does not constitute any form of advice, recommendation, representation, endorsement or arrangement and is not intended to be relied upon by users in making any specific investment or other decisions. Guests and presenters may have positions in any of the investments discussed.